in retrospect, it occurs to me now that I had been training my entire childhood to be a comedy writer, but I had no idea I was at the time. I didn't even, as a young person, even understand the concept that there was such a thing as a, as a, as a comedy writer. I mean, I, I just knew that I, I love to watch these people on TV and watch them obsessively. I would just watch, I just understood that Jackie Gleason was funny and Jack Benny was funny and Phil Silvers was funny and, you know, Groucho Marx on You Bet Your Life was funny. And, and I, I, I just, you know, I adored all that stuff, but it, I did, I never really quite kind of connected it to the idea of, of, uh, oh, this, you could do this. This is, this is, there's like a part somewhere in there for someone like me. And, and I guess probably the first time it even, even was just vaguely made sense to me of, uh, that it could be something like that was watching um, uh, the Dick Van Dyke show uh, when I was about 12, 13, 14 years old because uh, he, he played a writer. He was, I mean, the show, first of all, it was the funniest show on TV. It was, the, it, was, it was the best sitcom you ever saw at the time, still. And, and within that, so, so you loved what was being written for the show. And Carl Reiner, who wrote the show, was kind of a celebrity already. You, you had heard of him. You'd, you'd seen him. So you, so you knew who he was, unlike other comedy writers, like the people who wrote for Jackie Gleason or Jack Benny, who had no, no celebrity, no profile. And... Plus, Dick Van Dyke's character was playing a comedy writer who was writing for the kind of show that I enjoyed watching as, as a kid. So it finally kind of, at that point, started to take a little shape for me that, oh, there's these kind of smart people and they come up with these stories and they, they write these jokes. Oh, that's, that's great. That's, that's really cool. I mean, I understood that somebody wrote Mad Magazine. You know, as I was 10 years old, I bought that every month. Yes, because so you'd see the usual gang of The idiots. usual gang of And their names, and you know and they were And there wasn't writers. a performer. There was, there was writing. It was, it was, you know, it was, it was printed. So. And in, in, before each, or, each article, and it said written by each thing, so you knew. Yeah, yeah, which, which you know, when I was young, as you watched, as I say, more of the great comedians than Dick Van Dyke was really kind of the first sitcom. Yeah, well, Bill Go and the Honeymooners were sitcoms also, but they felt more like variety shows. I mean, they felt more just like, you know, it's a great comedian. It's Phil Silvers or it's Jackie Gleason, and they're always funny. Yeah. They're just, you know, they're, they're, they just are funny, you know. But the, the Van Dyke show was kind of the one that sort of made you connect the idea that, uh, yeah, he's great, she's great, the performers are wonderful, but it was clearly this this is even to even to a completely untrained unsophisticated kid sitting in queens it w it was kind of clear that there were that that there were minds you know being 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 used behind the scenes and what about you bob Owen? well oh, let's go back i didn't i didn't know why i wanted to be a writer at first so we go back to i'm i'm living in the bronx i'm a, i have asthma tremendous allergies so i'm an inside kid so my, my best friend became the television, and I fell in love. <laughs> and, you know, I'd watch, and, and, you know, I'd watch all day. I'd watch all night. My dad was a New York City cab driver. He'd come home at 1 o'clock in the morning. He had an inkling. He'd put his hand on the set. He knew it. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> and, and so he knew. And, uh, you know, and I mean, I just, I, I fell in love. I fell in love to such a point that Fridays, I'd run home from school. That's when the new TV guy would appear in the mailbox. I get it. I get a red pencil, and I'd sit on the floor in my bedroom, and I just go through it and see what what would look good. Now, this was before the days of DVR, so there used to be a ten o'clock in the morning movie, and I go, oh, I'd like to see that one. I'd circle it, and that's the day I pretend to be sick. My mom, that she didn't put up a fight, and I'd watch that. I mean, it was just a passion. It was, uh, and my I had I had wonderful parents who were indulgent because he knows I we 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 summered not at the same place, but up in the Catskill Mountains. Coincidentally, we used to go away yeah, every this, summer, half a block away from each other. Yeah, we didn't know each other. Place called just, Breezy Corners, and 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 my dad had a crazy son, which would be me. They would schlep a TV up there, up for me, put it in there, and then when my dad would come up on weekends, if we had bad, he'd climb this rickety ladder for his son, and adjust. How about now? Good. All right, just stay there. <laughs> and he would stay there, and I'd just watch a little bit and come down. 
and then you know that's that's how I started falling in love. And then I think when I got real hit one day was a, a Yankee rainout game, and they threw in a Marx Brothers movie, and I was just, I had the same experience. I was not with a rainout, but but I was floored. I was floored, and my dad was there, and I. Who, who are these people? What, what's going on? Why they're so, they're so funny? They're so chaotic. It's great. And he explains to me it was you know it's the Marx Brothers. So that's that's where it started. Yeah, I, it's it's amazing. This was the thing that amazed us when we met each other that we had ba basically we we had the same childhood. Well, what without was knowing your childhood? Other. Because I, you know this is an amazing story about yeah. a father who will climb. Yeah, to, uh, to, and to I point could still an antenna. See, I could still see it was not. It's not even a, a purchased uh, ladder. It was somebody put, you know, two by fours together and bad slats, and he would climb it for me. And I go, and I never forgot that. Because I, I, I got six kids, and I'm saying, I'm going to be as good a dad as he was to me. He's his indulgent self. Yeah. Well, well, I always appreciate my My dad really had, he, you know, he, he was not anywhere remotely close to the entertainment business. He had, he had terrific taste in comedy. You know, he, he wasn't that interested in kind of whatever the sort of the trendy sitcom of the day was, you know, the, the, when it was a big era of the, of the rural comedies and everything. He had no interest in that. It was, it was always just Gleason and Jack Benny and Phil Silvers and, you know, and, and so I, I was really, we only we were one TV family. So he would sit, he, he had really bad eyes. So he'd sit like right up, like his face was like, like touching the screen. And I'd sit a few feet behind him looking, looking around his head because I watched whatever he watched, which was also kind of a great thing about the three network universe that we grew up on in the 50s and 60s. There were no niches, so they weren't, once you outgrew cartoons or in the movies, Jerry Lewis movies, you had to learn to enjoy and appreciate whatever your mom and dad were gonna enjoy and appreciate because you weren't gonna get your own entertainment. It was, you know, so I watched whatever they watched and it was a great kind of, it was great grounding that because you know they would watch the old they'd watch Marx Brothers, W. C. Fields, Laurel and Hardy. You know when when there was a, a movie on or on TV, like I say, you know Honeymoon is Jack Benny that stuff, and you'd really get kind of you'd really get a fast, complete education, a history of comedy. I didn't know that's what I was doing. You know, I I wasn't like you know this is gonna this is gonna serve me, this is gonna serve me well when I'm a writer. <laughs> it was it was nothing like that, but ultimately it, it, it was all in there I mean and the not just the knowledge but the enthusiasm in I'm sure you were humor. a funnier kid than I was I'm very introverted though very yeah. introverted stayed yeah. in my room too. a lot my dad Me too. New York City cab driver Manny Mandel personality that could fill the room just just life at a party he, you know I, I can remember he used to walk around with a, a phone on his and he would just Hello, I mean, I mean, he was he was funny. He was a funny man. So that's that's where I got I get I get I get the drama from my mother, the comedy from my dad. Yeah, it's I mean, it's fascinating because because my dad also people my dad's gone now, but but people now years later will talk about how much charisma my dad had. Not me. <laughs> I, know? I don't have any. I, you know, yeah, I was born just... without a personality. I admit it. That's why I have special parking. But but my dad just yeah. wow, he glowed with it. Glowed with it. And you, it was humorous. Humorous, funny man. Funny, I, funny I grew up, I thought everybody was funny. Well, yeah, but if you grow up back in New York, you know, whatever place you go, oh, look, I cast the funny, the, I go pick up pickles for my, for my dad, and the pickle, the guy was behind the counter, was, everybody was funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I really grew up, I, I, I thought everyone was funny. Funny and sarcastic. In school, in school, I have to say, that's where I first had a glimpse that I, I may have been a little, a little funnier than exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. You know, it, 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 it was something that, the other kids, when we took the field trip, the other kids liked to sit next to me on the bus. You know, I, I, was, I would make comments on whatever we were passing, you know, on the thing. And then they would disseminate it to the, to the, to the other kids. You know, they, they'd go, you know, Lowell said when we passed that story, he, you know, it was... It was it, the same it, thing. You know yeah. what? I, I wouldn't be the class clown. I'd be the class... There's a difference. I was never voted class if, clown. If, if the teacher would say a straight line and I'd, I'd get a laugh and then... And then they'd come up to you at the end of class and go, funny, that was funny. And I, I just, oh, that was great, thanks. You know, and then, you know, then you become invisible again because that was what I like. You know, when you write a composition and there's humor in there, they don't appreciate that. Uh, so I get bad grades. I get bad grades. And I, so you did try it. I try, no, but not intentional. I try to make it a, a, a little humorous story. No. So, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I found, I found no outlet for that, really. Except, you know, I had, a, I had a best friend, Lenny Freifeld, who was also funny. 
We were best pals. We spent all day there. We made each other laugh. And, you know, it's, it's, and we, you know, we, we, we loved, we, we loved TV show, you know, whatever we saw, we'd talk about it the next day on the bus going to school and we, we entertained each other, you know, but we felt like we were kind of this, an oddball little, you know, just, just this, this odd little friendship that, you know, that nobody else would get us or anything. And then when I got to, when I got to college, when I got to Queens College, I was like, like 17 and, you know, you just, it's like a miracle. I don't know. It's like, it's a whatever, whatever it is that looks out for you, you in a, especially in a big school like that, you just find the like-minded. You know, there were so many people there, you know, tens of thousands of students. You just somehow, it doesn't take long. Within like a matter of, of, of a month or two, you have gravitated you, you have found your crowd. You've tumbled into the nerd pool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is very much that. It's like we're, we're not the good students. We're, we're, not, we're not the cute guys. We're not, we're not the ones who are popular with girls. We're not the athletes. We're the people who, for no good reason, are making fun of all of those people. And, you know, with no, no real right to be making fun of them. But I, I found that group, you know, that, and, uh, and so I was, I was comfortable. I sort of missed the transition from when you were really younger to high school. So did you fit in in high school? No, I didn't. I, you know what? I'm, I wasn't a student. You know, if, if the teacher was entertaining and she would capture my imagination, I, I'd be in class. If not, my brain would have wings and just fly out the oh, window. I can remember my mom saying to me, because I would get like bad grades relative to what, you know, my potential Mm -hmm. I, don't I know had no use... potential. That's the difference. <laughs> yeah. That's the difference. I tell him the true story. My dad owned a cab. He put in an extra steering wheel for me for when I graduated <laughs> high school. Yeah. No, I was, I was, I was supposed to be smart, <laughs> but but it was not manifested in any tangible way in high school. Yeah, you know, because I, you know, on standard tests and everything, you know, so they would they would call my parents in for meetings. Why? What's wrong? Because we, we gave him a test. He's not stupid. So, you know, why is he stupid? So it was like, it, 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 but, you know, and, and I would try to explain it. And, you know, my parents were great. I was very indulged like he was. They were very loving people, but they frustrated the hell out of them because, you know, I was, they had no opportunity to be educated, none whatsoever. I had the opportunity to be educated and I was screwing it up. You know, I mean, I was just basically just, 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 just messing it up. And I would try to talk to them about how boring the class was. And my mom would say, because of how much I love TV, you know, she would say something like, well, what do you think the teacher's going to be, Jackie Gleason? You know, is that, and I would go somewhere and say, yeah, that's how it should be. <laughs> that's what it should be. They should be, which, of course, is completely unfair and ridiculous. My, you know? my mother had a demented outlook when it came to me. He says, don't worry. He'll make a fortune in a modeling uh, career. <laughs> <laughs> and what about socially in high school? Oh, socially. I'm socially inept. Give me like I'm dating. I'm still socially inept. Dating? Oh. Listen, I'm no. married 37 years right now uh, to, to a young lady I went to high school with. She, she I don't know why, she, 14 years old, I'm 17, she developed a crush on me. We went our separate ways. We got back together. We now, six kids later, I didn't date. I was too shy, man. I don't Girl, someone would have to be really aggressive to, to no way, too shy. No, so that was a pain, nightmare. Pain, That was a nightmare. Uh, you know, I mean, when I, when I, after a certain point, you know, I, I, I came out here and I had a job and I, you know, I started to feel a, a, a Money. bit more comfortable. Money. Money. Yeah, Lydia, you know, but, 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 but he, never. He I've, taped you know, it to his shirt. I mean, you know, it was, I, I, I married 35 years. And, you know, it's like, um, uh, you know, when guys talk about missing when they were single, you know, uh, a little nostalgia for the single. I have none. <laughs> I, have, I have no, I have no bachelor nostalgia whatsoever. It's like, I, 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 I you know, I, I wasn't good at it then. I know I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be any better at it any time in the interim or now. It was it's uh, I, I mean we we sort of I guess both of us the classic sort of introverts who who you know who who become writers uh, you know I mean it, it's kind of a cliche and not every writer fits that cliche but we're we're a version you know we're we're a and uh, the women who are looking for guys with a sense of humor bullshit. <laughs> 
Oh shit! I had a great sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. They were looking for something, but it was nothing. That, yeah. Nothing that I was bringing. <laughs> Always standing in the corner at the party, observing. Always. Never have I ever been a participant. Always been the outside eye. I think it helps. Um, I, I think most of our characters over the years is sort of an abrupt change. So most of our characters over the years are not um, spectacularly uh, comfortable. You know, are not uh, kind of. Um, that doesn't uh, lead to such we, great we, comedy. Yeah, we don't. We don't particularly write you know, pure sort of winners, you know, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, it, it's, I, I think that's, we find amusement and charm and, and you know, uh, in that, you know, in, in, in that, it's a, that it's a struggle, you know, that it's always kind of uh, awkward. Awkward is funny, you know, comfortable is not, you know, it's, it's that sort of uh, uh, thing. So, I, I mean, I... I mean, Tom Hanks and Splash. He's as cute. It's 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 1984. He's as cute as can be, and he's 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 out of sorts. Yeah. He can't. He you know he just broke up with his girl because he can't make a commitment, and you know he's just. But that's that's of course the other great conceit is you you cast actors who are, who are very adorable, and you give them our discomfort. Yes. You know, which they have no right to have, you know, because they're. They're, they're they're lovely. They're charming. They're they're they're, they're handsome. You know, but we but we give them. You know, uh, we, we, we force our, our discomfort uh, upon them, right. and then it's, you know, everybody sort of, it's, it's, and it's more comfortable, I think, to watch them do it than it would be to, you know, to, to, to watch us stand. As people will experience when they watch this. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything we write is, is autobiographical in some way, and, and I think one of the reasons we, we, we've never had any, uh, any stress between us is that our autobiographies are so absurdly similar. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the, 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 the biography, the, 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 the emotional biography, are, uh, so that, you know, we, we, it, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of smooth in that way. But, you know, uh, I'd say like somebody will say to us, um, well, how is, how is a league of their own autobiographical? It's about, it's about two young women during world war two, um, who grew up in Oregon, I would say, oh, I, absolutely. When, when they get on the train to go to uh, Chicago to try to join the Women's Baseball League, that's, that's me and Bob Lou coming out to California to try to be comedy writers. Tell that, us that, about that. That's exactly what it is. Well, tell us about that coming out to California. How did that happen for each of you? Well, you, your, yours is more interesting because I just got in the car. I, I broke up with a girl. I was 1972. I, look, I'm a guy who never left his room, literally. But like the Lemmings, I was pulled because it's, it's I, I just, I love movies, wanted to write them. And, and so I got in my little Fiat and drove across the country in five days. And somewhere in Ohio, one hotel, I show up. I'm 5'7". I'm wearing a property of New York's Knicks jersey. And the guy said, oh, you play for them? <laughs> <laughs> I go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's off season. I'm the center. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, you know, um, it, it's that's another trench coins. We, we we found that letter. We we both came out to California like the same month of the same year. I mean, it is just weird. Um, I started I started writing a little bit in college, uh, not in any formal way, but I was in what was called it was a commuter college. wasn't You didn't have dormitories at Queens College in New York. You you went home to your parents' apartment at the end of the day every day. What what was your major there? Uh, I was originally was political science. Mm -hmm. Um, he was taking up space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what about you, Bob? You were, where did Communication you arts. Uh, New York Tech. It's in Manhattan. So you were interested in yeah, but in I was the wasting, industry. I was wasting point. my time. It, let's be honest. No, I was it, taking up space. You know Absolutely. what? Seriously. There's Vietnam and there's me. I'm not going there. I'm going to school. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, World War II, I'm the first one to join up, but not that. So, I... I, I we were in these house plans, which was sort of like their version of fraternities. You, you didn't have a fraternity house where you lived in. You, it was just a, it was a social organization. And they used to do this thing at Queens College every year in this enormous auditorium. They had sat like 2,300 people called uh, Queens College Frolics. And any house plan could audition to get like a 10 or 15 minute skit into the, and they would take eight. 
and it was a big, it was actually quite a big event at Queens College. So my, my friends and I decided we would try to, to get it, to get into it. And it, it, it's kind it's weird. This is where the screen gets wavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and now I'm young and handsome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 and uh, it was kind of a weird thing because we sat around to try to write a sketch. And as I said, I, I meant, I said, I thought everybody was funny. I gravitate to funny guys. All my buddies were funny. But when it came time to start to write, it was it was a it was a funny thing that I seemed to be the only one who had any sense of a line following the preceding line. Now, this is not sophisticated. I'm not saying I was a writer, but it was like you can't just keep pitching jokes. The previous person said something. The next person has to say something that in some way demonstrates that he heard what the previous person said. It's called I mean, progression. Yes, you know, I mean, it's very simple, but they didn't do it. I mean, smart guys, funny guys, you know, but it was like, the, and, and that's why I say, I think just all those years of, you know, watching the Dick Vett and all those, those shows had kind of, you know, had, had just emptied out a space inside my brain that this was, that this was filling. Um, so we got, we got this in, we got into the show and, uh, uh, we won frolics. We it was it's, it's kind of, at that time and place. I was kind of like a big deal. I still have the trophy at home uh -huh. in my basement. I've had it restored a couple of times. It's forty years ago, and uh, that was very exciting. That was really thrilling. You know, it was, you got big laughs. You know, and I was in the show. You know, I, I did a song, and you know, and and, and uh, uh, you know, twenty two, twenty three hundred people laughing at the same time is it's kind of it's it's kind of an ego boost, and and. This guy I kind of knew, uh, Mark Rothman. I had known him as a little kid, and then I had lost touch with him, and then I met him again. Mark was little? In college. I was little. <laughs> uh, Mark was never little. He was like 6'6". Six, yeah, six. Mark is my ex-partner. He's like 6'5", like 280, you know. He and, looked like uh, a ficus tree with lips. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and and, and uh, he said to me, uh, he said, you know, there are people doing this for a living. And, and uh, as I say now, you know, when I like talk to students or something, it was the first moment that I actually knew what kind of work I was out of. You know, I, I, I didn't think I was able to do it, but at least now I could like tell my parents, this is what I'm going to fail at, <laughs> you know, at, at trying to be a comedy writer as opposed to having no kind of direction or, 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 or focus at all. So my parents were actually kind of excited. Uh, it wasn't sort of the cliche of, no, we want you to be a doctor, a lawyer. You, that boat had sailed, you know. I mean, they would, the, the fact that I seemed to uh, evince some enthusiasm for something, you know, that, that, that could be thought of as a career was kind of uh, encouraging to them. Because uh, I don't think there was uh, any money in just, you know, lying around reading the New York Post all day. Uh, and uh, we started writing. Mark and I started writing and we were kind of knuckleheads uh we were trying to jump onto a sinking ship this was the early 70s and we were trying to become variety show writers having no notion that that was pretty much going to be uh -huh. the end of the variety show format was was staring us right in the face um he we, still writes carol burnett sketches <laughs> <laughs> i would have loved to have been on that show and uh in fact, we, one day, I mean, this is just, this is almost sad. We were living in Queens, right? He was living with his parents. I was still living with my parents, we were like 21. And and we just wrote some sketches for Carol Burnett and put them in an envelope and mailed them to her. It's not like, so just sad. Wrote. I wrote a sketch. Carol Burnett's show came out to, to New York, and they filmed at the Ed Sullivan Theater once, and a friend who I went to school with was an usher. I gave I gave them a script. Yeah. I, at least you heard yeah, so I, I never heard from them. No, they were very nice. Her, her I guess it was her husband, uh, Joe Hamilton. Some wrote us back a lovely list. I mean, you know, we don't take on solicited material and everything, but like he acknowledged that it that it arrived, and we were like excited that that it had made the round trip, that it had gotten to California, and gotten back again. It was it was, I mean, we really our greatest our greatest asset was ignorance, the fact that we didn't understand how little chance we had. But here's an interesting question, especially for young aspiring writers who might see this, because you've sort of passed over this. So you and Mark were sitting there going, well, let's write a sketch for Carol Burnett. And yeah, or Flip send Wilson. It to or, yeah. So you were sitting, so you were actually getting together with Mark. Yeah. And writing. Oh, like every day. And what about you? Were you sitting down every day and writing your sketches? First of all, I would start with jokes. I'd start, I had my little book of little one-liners. Then I would write 
little little thoughts, little funny little thoughts. And I used to be an artist. So I used to be my little cartoons. And yeah, then I would yeah, like I said, I wrote this this Carol Burnett sketch that I gave to my this guy Mark, who was an usher, and he gave it to uh, I can't remember Arnie uh, Arnie, oh, Arnie Kogan. Kogan yeah. Arnie Kogan. Yeah. I never heard from it, but, so I assumed it wasn't brilliant. But <laughs> but no, I I mean you know where you you had to you had if you want to be something you got to do it. Well, you got to write. I mean, and that's of course that's the break we have as opposed to say uh, a, a director or, or producer. You can practice at home. You know, it's a little hard to practice producing movies at home, but you can you can write. Nobody may read it, but you can always write. And 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 that's exactly how we got it. Mark's father was again these parallels. His father's a cab driver. My father wasn't in that business, but Mark Rothman, my ex partner's father, was a limousine driver. And he had the account, he used to drive celebrities from New York City down to Philadelphia for the old Mike Douglas afternoon talk show. That was his big account. That's how he made his, his living. And he just told us one day that he was driving Jack Klugman and Tony Randall from New York to Philadelphia. They'd already been on the air two years on The Odd Couple. This was, this was 1972. They had already done two seasons. And he said, I'm going to have them in the car. We went home. We immediately, we wrote an Odd Couple episode, Mark and I. It was the first time we had actually tried to write a sitcom episode. You, you have to understand my, my not only had I never written anything, I'd never met anybody who'd ever written anything. And our naivete was such, or at least mine was, Mark always had more confidence than I did. I thought to write like a half hour episode, you had to be some kind of a genius. I mean, and I, I'm not saying this, I, I, I know it sounds facetious, but I go, it has to start someplace and go to you know, film school or, you know, that, and, and it's, it's got to all make sense and come to a conclusion and everybody, you have to know where all the characters are and every, you know, I mean, I just had no background. And you have to put in, in the canned laughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we wrote an episode. Mark's father gave it to, to Jack and, 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 and Tony. Somehow they didn't lose it. They brought it out to California with them when they came back. They gave it to Gary Marshall. He read it. Gary in those days was always looking for young writing talent. The episode was completely wrong. It, it, they could never have done it on. It was, it was it was a silly kind of thing. But there was something about it he liked, and he had his as one of his assistants called us and said, uh, you know, if you if you get on a plane and fly out here, you know, and show up at Paramount, uh, Gary will find something for you. You know, he'll he'll get you. You know, you be P PAs or some. You know, you do something. You'll you. You prove yourself. You'll, you know, stick you in a closet and you'll write all day and don't tell the writers guild. <laughs> you know, and, and you, and you, you know, and and uh, and so we did, and 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 that that's that's how we started. Some some listen. We lived a blessed existence. He and I, and I. It is a day doesn't go by because I have a similar story. I got in a car, and and my dad who who wanted to be an architect when he was young, but 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 his his dad died, so he had a he had to give up a dream and support three of the ugliest sisters you've ever seen. And I'm not kidding, because I would rather kiss their asses goodbye when they leave than their faces. So he, he, he completely understood. He said, go after it. Your mom and I are here to support you, you know? So I went. So, so one Sunday night, I'm watching MASH, and, and, his, and, and I, I know the, the Marx Brothers, they, they parody the Marx Brothers in, in this guy. I don't know the episode. So I, I, wrote, I wrote a spec note. Did I know what I was doing? I just wrote it, but then, and then when I finished, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't have an agent, so I called up Fox. I got, I got the MASH office. Phone rings, and Larry Gelbart gets on the phone. His assistant is sick that day. He said, hi, I'm not, not 20 something or anything. He says, sure, bring it in, I'll read it. He's not bullshitting me. I, I, would I do that? Would you do that? Maybe you would. I, I go, Early I, in my career, I used to do that. I, I, I actually I, used I, to do that. I ran over there. A half hour later, he called me. I read it. I'm, I'm going to give you an episode. Man, I, I, I needed help putting my pants on. So, so that's, that, that's, that's how that began. So. But it was, it, there was more. I, you know, again, I, I don't want to turn this into a uh, you know, stage. Oh, those were the days kind of thing. But I do feel it was a little more freewheeling. 40 years ago it was a little bit more like a like a wildcat business, you know, still. I mean, we just caught the end of that. It probably even been even more so in the decades preceding that. But you didn't have a lot of people. I'm not putting this down. It's a totally valid system. But you didn't have a lot of people who had been trained right. for the profession, who had, who had, you know, had gone to to film schools. You didn't have all the Ivy Leaguers who 
you know, it, you, they weren't training on the internet and, you know, have their own kind of, you know, websites and blogs and right. everything. So it was really Being just kind of... seems to be more closed, locked. I, 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 I always say the he's, meta... He's got two sons who are writers. I got a daughter who wants to be a writer and you go, wow. Oh, it's so you? much harder. Oh, my so God. So much harder. But I, the metaphor, it was, it was like... It was like uh, comedy writing in those days was like was like a pool table with a, with a bro, bro with a short leg, and every all the loose balls just rolled towards one pocket, and 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 we were like kind of those loose those loose billiard balls, and 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 sitcom was sort of the 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 pocket, you know, and and they were and because because I when I a couple of years later when I had a little status in, in TV I hired tons of young writers with no background just off of spec scripts and funny little messages that they that they mail to the studio and stuff like that and it was just it was real kind of uh it was just a real wide open shoot 'em up kind of kind of kind of thing and and uh we were just i think we were real lucky to have caught the end of that yeah. that you know it was what i call the uh hey you seem like a funny kid uh era of 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 hiring writers okay so so you both came out uh, got jobs right away, which is which is. Wait, well, you, got, well, you got. A, I got a job, but I didn't stay long because you, there was a gentleman there who didn't like a young pisher around, and all I wanted to do was learn. I, I, you I wasn't at, the, at Mash. Yeah, you? I wasn't there to, to to steal anyone. I just wanted to learn. Teach me. This was Larry Gelbart, man. I, you know, this yeah. was this this. I knew his credits. So anyway, so that I came and I left. So, so that was a cul-de-sac. Yeah. Now did you? Now I know. I know you went on with Mark. To have a very successful career in television before you went into movies, and did you stay in television? You know what? I wrote for comedians. I wrote you know little things to try and stand you know, nightclub stand-ups. Or, yes, or, yes. You know, I, well, yeah, the nightclub stuff. You know, I, and I, I, that at that period of life, I ran into, I met Gary. You know what? I, I tried stand-up also. And stand up is very tricky. Gary is Gary Shandling. Gary right Shandling, yeah. yes. I completed your So collection. so so one you know, you know, Monday night you try out and afterwards he came up to me and he says, Very funny. It was the two of us because we got so but the thing about it is, if you want to come back a different night, then she starts putting this is with you know, trial by uh, by fire. Put you on one, one thirty, and it's who are you working to four people you don't know and then you know it's just it was it was again another cul de sac, but you know, you tried. I saw him once. He was funny. So you were at that point thinking about doing stand up. Stand -up. Yeah, but my heart wasn't in that. My uh -huh. heart was definitely not in that. I was, I was married. Like the first year married, my wife was coming with me, and it, you know, if like I said, you put on a prime time, people will listen. You could be funny. If not, don't waste your time. So, so while he was doing sitcoms, and well, well the, the, you look, were continuing. I wanted to be in the movies. I wanted to write movies because that's where I fell in love. I was fell in love when I was ten years old with, he you know everybody. You know, some like it hot. Place we we like again. We're back, going back to the mountains. It's the Catskill Mountains. Every Tuesday night is movie night, so they would take the luncheonette, move all the uh, the tables away, set up the chairs. I would wait. I would wait. I know till like it's six thirty. I could still see him now. Guy shows up in a country a. Tan Country Squire Ford station wagon. With the would, reels, the big And I would help cans. him. I would help him set up. It's like I'm from that Italian movie. You know, it's an Italian movie. I would help him set up. You know, seven o'clock cartoons for the kids. Seven thirty movies for the adults. And one night was some like it. Yes, hot and our night. bungalows it was Friday night. Yeah, and, and, and we and, also saw some like it. Hot. The same it. summer. That was it for me. That was. I was you know, 10 years jaw dropping. Old. Jaw dropping. I spent the rest. You know, you talk about you know Tony Curtis talking around. I, that's the way I talked the rest of the summer, <laughs> and I knew from there what I wanted to do. You did. Uh, from that moment on, I knew I wanted to be a screenwriter. No question about. It. No question about it. Did you did did you see it a lot of times? Did I see? I even when it's on now, I turn it. It just it throws me back. It's I just I'm thrown back to that night in the summer. I'm a kid staring up at the screen, and I'm just I'm in awe. I, I just, it just, I, I, I'm in a great place. Okay, so you came, you, you, you tried to be a comic. Right. In the back of your mind, you always want to be a screenwriter. He's still working in TV. But, and I'm trying to get into the movies. I'm so writing all these picture. What did you, so, so my question to both of you is, how did you? 65 weeks of unemployment. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And how did you f finally get into the movie business? For well, each of you, what's each of your stories? Well, it's the same story. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. I mean, we because uh, I can't. I went. I went. Oh, that's right. I got married, 
And my wife says, it's great to have a dream, but I want a house. Right. <laughs> so we, we went downtown, we got married in a civil ceremony, and then she dropped me off at Paramount, where I went to work for Mr. Lowell Gans. Yeah. Well, uh, you uh, did? Yeah, yeah. Mark and I met, <laughs> met Bob Lou at the Comedy Store, you know, on, on Sunset Boulevard. It was a place you used to mm. hang around and make fun of people who had better jobs than you. And, uh, you know, instead of going in. Yeah. And, uh, and um, uh, we, we, you know, uh, with a, after a couple of fits and starts, we, we, Mark and I, you know, became somewhat successful in the TV business. We had a, a couple of our own shows. And, and, and uh, uh, we always wanted uh, Bob Lou to come work for us, you know, uh, be on, on a, one of our staffs or something. And he, he didn't seem that interested. That was from seeing him as a comic? Uh, no, no, well, no, it was no, really just from hanging around, around with him, hang actually. Around. But, but the thing is, <laughs> is it's, it's what I tell my kids. I tell anybody, you never know what's going to lead you to your dream. You don't know. Get the foot, get the big toe in the door, then slip it in. Just and then you get the rest of you. No, like I say, it was still from the "you seem like a funny kid" era. But, but you know, I, and you it was, seemed like a funny kid. But it, it, to me, that's that's where you learn to write. Those years that I worked on on, on TV shows. Yeah. Well, the greatest thing was that he, as he says, he got married and he said, "Well, maybe I should take one of these." offers that Lowell and Mark have I mean, and he came to work with us. On what show? Uh, um, Busting Loose. Busting Loose. Busting it was Loose. a show we had on in 76, something like that. Maybe I'd be wrong on the year. It was Adam Arkin and, and uh, anyway, it was, it, was, it was on for two seasons and uh, it was a lot of fun, all young writers. Um, I was the apprentice. Yeah. Mark and I were like 26, 27, and we were the oldest writers on the staff, you know. So it lasted like a season and a half, I think, and, and, got, uh, and, and got canceled. But, you know, after that, and then like soon after that, Mark and I split up, uh, and I was kind of working. Why did you split up? Oh, boy, there's a, there's a whole other interview. Well, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the short version. Well, the short version uh, was... Uh, Mark was uh, Mark was underappreciated, I thought, by the outside world. Uh, that uh, in the room writing we were equals, but in our sort of in our um, head writer persona, um, he didn't he didn't seem to be carrying um, to, to outside eyes. He didn't seem to be carrying as much of the load, uh, and 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 it, it got him sort of irritated, and he would get into. Uh, different sort of feuds with uh, with people, which was uncomfortable. And finally, he got into like a big feud with somebody who was like really kind of important to us. And he said, "Well, I'm leaving." We were at Paramount all these years. Says, "I don't want to work here anymore." And I kind of said, "Well, you know, I kind of do. I <laughs> still want to work here anymore." And that hurt his feelings. He was very angry at me about that. Uh, and and you know, so I'm I'm sort of uh, uh, the villain in that story, as you know. Uh, but but you know I'm sure he has a point and and um, uh, or not. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, but it was I mean it was time for us to stop. It, it was it was at that point it had become a kind of a a silly awkward partnership because of the misperceptions about us was was very it, it was very destructive towards him and and was ultimately becoming very uncomfortable for me. Uh, so I worked for a couple of years as a saying I was, I was producing a couple of shows, head writing. I was directing some episodes. I, I had a big, nice pilot deal, and I would team up with different writers to write various pilots and 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 things like that. And uh, uh, Babalu was kind of my favorite writer because because when when <laughs> when it's like at, at some point I was brought. Back, I hadn't been on Happy Days in years. They were having some trouble. There, there was a little, there was a minor insurrection there, and Gary said, "Why don't you come back for a, for a season or two and kind of quiet things down a little bit?" And you know, and, and they, urinate on the fire, yeah. so to speak. You know, they they remember you fondly from your days here, and I think it would they'd be they, they'd be very they'd very much appreciate. They'd feel like it was a step in the right direction. When I broke up with Mark and didn't have a partner, if I had to fix a script quickly. I would grab whoever, it could be the lowest depressed, it could be a guy who up at that point was only getting our lunch, but I knew like he wanted to be a writer or she, and I'd send down, I said, oh, here's the problem, here's where we're going with this. They, can't, they don't want to do it this way, they want to do it this way, but if I, can't, if I don't do it this way, then I can't get to that point, we want to do this, but I have an idea, and I think this, and I would talk, and I would talk, and I'd talk, and I'd be writing while we talked, and an hour would go by, 
and I'd say, um, thank you. Thank you very much. I go, great, you know, guy. I go, I don't mean it was What about your sandwich? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that was an extreme case, but my point was I, I always felt more comfortable to be able to actually actually talk to somebody, not to a recording device or the internal monologue inside my head. The sound of my thoughts is like, is always like, it's just crucial. And you up until then had been writing alone. Correct. Correct. So yes, he did, writes with his brain. <laughs> <not with> his <laughs> so how did you feel brain. about teaming up with somebody? Well, we weren't teamed up yet. I know, but I mean, a, well, about coming to, but this, but this was coming to work. This was listen. Yeah. I'm, I was the apprentice. I was the, you know, when when somebody had to write a tag or a button or something like that, that was me. I, I had a long way to go. It wasn't until what? Well, I, I, like I say, I would always when I had a pilot deal, I would sort of pick a writer, and then we started to do a couple of things together because right. I liked his writing, and that was, that was, that was the most enjoyable. And I just frankly felt of all the people I'd been writing with, he was the most creative and was the one who was sort of bringing the, the kind of the uh, things that I, I thought, you know, were like, oh, geez, I, th that, jo that joke or that thought or that character uh, thought, you know, just and, that, that yeah. would never have, and it wasn't a he's coming we, from a fresh we, place. We were two of us writing this pilot. I was invited to write a pilot. It wasn't until Mr. Ron Howard on Happy Days. Well, I was working Happy Days and that had sort of, that was kind of running its, course for me. I, had, I you know, it had been kind of like an, a real comfortable place for me to land, to go back to now that I was a single again, because, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a good job. I mean, it was a really good job in every way that a job can be a good job, but it wasn't, I had done it like six years or five, six years earlier. And, you know, and I, so I knew it was kind of like a, like a comfortable place to park uh, for a while. And we were doing pickups late at night and I was standing next to Ron, who I knew really well by this point, and you know had been one of the people who had been sort of uh, instrumental in getting Gary to bring me back to the show. And uh, he just turns to me and he says, um, "I'm going to direct movies. Are you going to write movies?" And I was kind of tired. It was late, and I said, "Well, if you direct them, I'll write them." Now this is Ron Howard. This is Ron Howard. I mean, he was hope. You know, he was he was Richie Cunningham. You know, I mean, he would. You know, but he he was he was focused. I mean, he. Unlike me, he always had a had kind of like a a, a concept of of where he wanted to be from and, the womb. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they would never say anything more about it. Soon after that, he quit the show, and then soon after that, I quit the show. And uh, a little more time went by, and he would call me from somewhere, and he was he was like directing a Roger Corman thing or a TV movie right. or something, and he would call and he'd say. You know, I haven't forgotten. We're, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do a movie together some someday. You know, we're gonna do a studio movie. You know, something I had never written a, a movie, and uh, he and this guy Brian Grazer, who had also met me, because Brian at that time was thinking about trying to get into the pilot field as a producer, and and they said, oh well, the guy at Paramount, you should talk to is Lowell, mm -hmm. and so he invited me to lunch. Was talking to me, sort of like, and this is what Brian is great at, who just kind of, you know. Drain, just, just suck all the intelligence <laughs> out of you and make it his own, you know, which is great. It's a, it's a, it's a great skill. Um, and, uh, you know, and Brian said, well, what about this guy, Lowell, that, you know, that I met? And Ron said, that's my guy. That's the guy I, you know, and so that was kind of a happy coincidence that they knew each other and they both knew me for different reasons. And they called me in and they said, we have this, this movie idea. And it came as a, at a great time for me because the pilot field was kind of beating me up. Uh, I was having trouble getting pilots on. You know, everybody kind of liked the writing, but it, it wasn't, uh, you know, the, the pilots weren't, weren't, weren't going to series. And I was, I was directing some TV, including some pilots, but I wasn't really loving it. It felt like kind of I was just doing it because it was, sort of professionally convenient. You know, I mean, I gave it everything I had. Nobody was complaining about my work, but it wasn't really scratching the itch. Um, and and uh, I said, boy, this is coming at the perfect time. This is really, and, and family, it was, it was right for family too. I, I didn't wanna, I didn't actually wanna be at the studio till midnight at tables anymore. I had a young family, yeah, that's I, I, had two, I had two little babies at this point. My wife was, 
you know, so I said, well, if I, if I write movies, I can control my hours better. That's all I ever wanted to do was be a TV writer. I didn't, unlike Bob Blue, I didn't come out here to write, I mean, I, and I assumed I never would. I, I, oh, I thought I would be a TV writer until I was an old TV writer, and I knew old TV writers. I knew, you know, Harry Crane and Milt Josephsberg and Bob Howard, and great, great, great guys, you know, of, of, of another generation. You know, guys who had broken in in radio, you know, and I, again, I was just lucky I caught the, the tail end of them. Uh, and I just thought, I, that's who I'll be. I'll, I'll be 70 and I'll still be, you know, working on a, sh you know, but. Can I, can I amend one thing? It, it wasn't that I was a snob, because some of the stuff that I loved as a kid, I mean, if I got the chance to write for Phil Silvers, I would have been delighted to stay in television. I just. We, I, he did. I didn't have the opportunity to write for. Yeah, I worked for Jack and Tony, you know, which was kind of. I didn't. I yeah. got lucky enough to write for Tom Hanks, the Martin. Oh, uh, yeah. With the, with the, and and I, that is a big thing. If you, know, you, you have wanna, the you guy, you be on something as great as you know it can be, but, uh, but I mean, I I loved my TV time. Boy, the writers' room, the table at a writers' room, and when I got to run the table at a writers' room, which I did for years. That was my favorite thing, and you know, all ego aside, I, I felt like that was really my calling because I could, I could think and talk, and, I, and if somebody said anything, I, I heard it and I, and I filed it, and, and I would amaze them because this is ego talking, but I would amaze them because a minute later, in my spritz, I would incorporate what they said and point to them, you know, <laughs> say you, you said it, and, and I had incorporated into what I was doing to make a whole kind of thing about it, and I would, they would, it was. I, I it, it was one. I mean, I loved it. I loved that. I, I loved that world. But but they were they were beating me down a little bit, and not so much the internal world, the networks, the pilot field, going up to the office to pitch your pilot, casting a pilot, trying to get your pilot made, trying to get something on the air. And I could have become you know kind of a head writer or a producer for hire around town, which I was probably would have been the next step if I couldn't get any pilots. And I assume there would have been work for me for. Uh, uh, you know, a decent number of years. So Brian, so Brian and Ron Howard. Brian and Ron bring me this, this like one sentence movie idea. Based on an article that I remember seeing in the New York Post is like about that big. Yeah, well, it was literally like, like this. And they said uh, two guys had been arrested for running a call girl operation out of the city morgue. And I said, okay, there was a part of me that was going, boy, this, I, love, I love Ron. Brian, I don't know that well, but Ron loves Brian, so I love him too. And, and, uh, uh, it's the right time. Everything's the right time. I'm full of this kind of pent up energy that that is kind of getting blocked a little bit now for the first time in TV. And it fits in with my life. And and I said to them, you know, if I do this, I've never actually written a movie, you know, and I said, if I do this, I think I'm going to want to write it with a partner, you know, and 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 they went, you could see the relief on their faces. They're great because they thought I was going to pick somebody with, with experience. And I said, there's this guy, Babalu, that I know. <laughs> and they went, well, what does he do? I said, well, he's kind of worked for me a couple of places where I've been on in, 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 in TV. And you could just sort of like, oh, oh, great. He's going to get somebody less experienced <laughs> than, yeah. than he is. I said, no, no, you, you got to, you trusted me this far. You got to trust this me one This is step Babalu. Further. What do you mean? I'm at a freeway selling fruit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, but I mean, they, they fell in love with him kind of quickly. Yes. You know, and uh, and and my instinct was right. You know, I, I'm I'm, you know, I I, I got the right wife, you know, and, and the right writing partner. My instinct was was very right about about and this. And the name of that movie was Night. That Shift. was Night Shift. Yeah, 1981. Yeah. That's the movie that that uh, fooled us, because <laughs> as he could tell you during the previews. Oh yeah, they, everybody at the studio told it was going to be a massive we drove runaway down, hit. We drove down to Costa Mesa for a screening. Costa Mesa, and, right. and all the Warner Brothers exec came down in this massive, high-end bus, and and then they got the scores. It's bigger than Superman. <laughs> it's bigger than Superman. Yeah. So you know we. We're picking out places for the Oscars, you know? it's like, it's, and then and then it opened to the to you know wind blowing through the theaters, you know, and and, and it's weird because now in, in years after that, people always assumed it was a hit. I just met someone it was sort of fondly I remembered. I just but, met someone last week. He was like he was like seven. He said, "It's the first R comedy I've ever seen, and I still remember every line." Yeah. Yeah. This was last week. I oh guess. no, but we also met like people in the business yeah. who you know you met like. Uh, like like Chris Farley or Vince Vaughn, yes. or all these people who had like seen it when they were in high school or something, and they were like, "Oh man, night shift!" They go, yeah, and, and, but we were 
we were heart sick because, you know, we didn't know. It was our, it was our first. Because we're still doing TV. We're yeah, still, we didn't leave TV. We didn't leave that. Because we, we, like, we, we, like, we have little ones at home. Yeah. So we have families, you know. And, and uh, you know, Jewish little kindergarten schools are very expensive. <laughs> so. and, we, and we wrote. We wrote, I mean, not that maybe this is relevant, but I mean, it's just for a perspective. I wrote Night Shift for the same money I used to make per week in TV. You know, so it was like, are you really willing to start over as far as, you know, financially is concerned and reputation wise? You know, yeah, you're just going to. a lot gonna, longer to write it. Uh, yes, you know, <laughs> you're going to really claw your way all the way back right. up again, you know. Uh, and then we thought, well, you know, we did it. We, you know, we struck gold, and there was fool's gold. You know, I mean, I still love the movie, and I'm, you know, it, it, it but it, 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 uh, it was, it's kind of, it's a little heartbreaking. I mean, you can't just kind of say, well, if you thought it was good, that's all that matters. You know, it's, it's a career, it's a profession. You, you, it's how you feed your family. It's not, it's not just, it's not a hobby. <laughs> you know, so, so if, if, if you go and everybody says it's going to be a big hit, and then it's, uh, it's the opposite of a big hit. It, you, you, I, we were kind of staggered, you know, and then see again, this is where this is where Brian and, and people of that demeanor are great. He just said, uh, let's do another one. Here you were two two TV show comedy professionals. With with great credits and and a certain amount of power and, and prestige in the business. And you now are sitting down to write a motion picture for the ah, first time. Ah. So tell us a little bit about as much as you'd like to tell about not only the you know the difference in the in the hours but the but you, you know the creative differences you were writing half hour situation comedies now you're sitting down and writing a movie that takes an hour and a half an hour and 45 minutes. Did uh, you feel like you knew what you were, tell tell us I about didn't it. feel like I knew what I was doing. I I, I found it very challenging. Um, I tried not to show him that I felt like I didn't know what I was doing, but, but the, I, I'm not saying all the TV work I did was wonderful or even that any of it was necessarily wonderful, but I could see it like I can see that wall behind you. You know, it's like the 23 minute form. If something happened in B scene, I could tell you instantly how it was going to affect something in F C, you know, it, 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 it I, I could see it all at once. You know, so if somebody brought me a TV idea, an episode idea, and it didn't exactly work, but I liked the idea, I could put it in the rudiments of, of a bad story very quickly and then hopefully turn it into a more interesting and, and, and uh, you know, more creative story not too, not too long after that. You know, it was just all, it, it was all visible, at least to me, whether my judgments were good, my taste was good, it was all kind of kind of visible quickly uh the movie wasn't like that or something would happen and it was like trying to see all four walls at the same time i, I it, it was it felt it felt very challenging I, I know i had to i had to break the habits of a lifetime and i don't mean just a writing lifetime i mean a lifetime lifetime and be professional uh in that i uh, that we really we we outlined and we and we, index we had index cards and we really yes we pinned up index cards on bulletin boards and really I mean that's basic that's just basic but I'm saying my whole life had been one of kind of uh, well I'm smart I'll show up I'll you know I'll 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 fake it you know cause, and that's what made me such a crappy student you know there was just I didn't do the work you know and and, and it it disciplined me you know in a way that 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 even writing in TV hadn't. Um, uh, and, and uh, I mean, there's other kinds of discipline in TV, especially when you're the head drive, just, you know, getting the work done and being, you know, being responsible for the whole operation. But as a writer, you know, I didn't just go, well, um, I've always got ideas, things will all, I'll, you know, uh, the reactor will start complaining and I'll, I'll have a great thought on how to, you know, uh, on, on how to cool that, you know, in, in, in two seconds. Uh, this wasn't that, you know, this, this was, this, this was, uh, uh, this was more challenging than that. Um, uh, you know, we, we talked a lot. We, we talked a lot. We, we, we used Ron and Brian as a resource. Yes. We'd get to each step in the process and we'd, you know, we'd call them in and we'd say, here's what it sounds like. 
you know, and we'd, we'd pitch it out and they'd go, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty funny, you know, <laughs> something, you know, we go, okay, all right, you know, we just kind of keep going and then we learned a different kind of rewriting than in TV. TV is beat the clock rewriting. You know, this was a real kind of um, uh, just, um, all right, you know, what, what's, what's a better idea? And then, like you said, you know, no, nobody's, nobody's really rushing you. Right. They're just sort of saying third act, you can see it coming, not that interesting, not that exciting, not, you know, and you go, yeah, yeah, you're right, it isn't, you know, and what would be better? So, you know, we went through like four third acts on Night Shift, but I would say at our leisure, but, you know, really giving everything kind of like a, a try that, you know, it's not like, well, you know, in that world of, you know, do you want it good or you want it Tuesday, you want it good, <laughs> you know, Tuesday's not that important. I mean, the bad thing, of course, was, in TV, you always said, there's always next week, you know, if, but where like a night shift, it didn't open to expectations. There was no next week, <laughs> you know, there was nothing even in the pipeline, you know, it was, it was, well, now, where do we go from here? I mean, those TV laughs are fantastic. You know, you watch the Big Bang Theory in the audience, and deservedly so, because it's funny, you know, when... When somebody says something to Sheldon and they know the audience knows Sheldon doesn't understand it, they are laughing before he's, you know, or going back to, to our era when Carol O'Connor just had to, you know, listen to what somebody was saying, you know, and, and the, the, the tittering starts right. in the, and those are great, you know, that's, you know, and, and sort of what, what, what Neil Simon was sort of great at is he could make that happen before the end of the first act. You know, he, he was getting those series laughs, those series character laughs before the before before the first intermission, you know, and, and that was sort of like genius. And, and we kind of we were kind of familiar with that as a um, as a template of how you kind right. of, of how you do it. But I was saying the other side of it was Gary Marshall, my my mentor, my, my teacher would say, and this will this joke will only make sense to people who have watched Laverne and Shirley. He would say. Well, the thing about movies is, you know, you don't have to think of, you know, um, where's the scene for Carmine? You know, <laughs> it's like, which, which uh, TV. So, well, I haven't serviced all the characters this week yet. I have to, you know, I have to do that. So there was a, I think we just chose to embrace the freedom of it and go, we'd like this character to have this going on in his life. And who can tell us they don't? Nobody could come and say, well, wait a minute. Last week, I didn't have a brother. Now I have a brother because you found a funny idea for, a, for an episode about a, about, a, about a brother. You know, so it, it was, I mean, it was really, it was really fun to invent Bill Blaze Jowski in, in Night Shift, the Michael Keaton character, and just have kind of no, sort of, sort of, no limitations on, on, on what we what we would do with that. One of my, my sons arrived. The younger one took the Neil Simon plays out into his little office and read them a couple of years ago. I said, "This is this is a good idea for you," yeah. you know. And 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 when when he, I have no stake in this. I don't know Neil Simon. I met him twice, you know. But but I, I'd say when he would be sort of criticized, it would be that that it was sort that his plays were kind of um, like. Uh, high grade sitcom and that was like that was like uh that was issued as a criticism right. as kind of a put down and i would i would sort of go first i'm not sure how accurate that is and secondly so what you know it, it's like that's that's hard to do and it's and it's like if you can do that you know it, it's it's it, it's kind of it's kind of miraculous uh, you know, with whatever the you know we could we could list twenty of them, but but uh, we we were I think very influenced um, uh, by that you know by by that I I swear to God this is a true I used to keep is a play it's a book called the best of Neil Simon's his early works I used to keep it by the toilet and I would read I would just it's his char you know from everybody you learn I learned char you know from 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 him I learned character. Just, just reading it from Billy Wilder. It's that, that's that's movie making. We're both Billy Wilder fanatics, which does not make us unique by 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 any means. You, um, uh, you know. And then something else happened. 
just before we started making movies, and I, I don't, our work would not be comparable in any way, but, you know, when, when Annie Hall came out in 1977, which is just about three or four years before we started writing features, it was devastating. I mean, it was, every comedy writer knew, I knew who had aspirations to write a longer form than 23 minutes was kind of, kind of bowled over. Uh, just the, the, the manner, the, the, the freshness, the, the freshness, the naturalism of this, of, of speech, you know, it, it, I mean, there had been like a, another kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the SNL thing that sort of happened was, was just going to start to happen in, in, right. in features also, you know, it was, it was right around the same time as, uh, as, uh, uh, Animal House and Steve Martin, you know, was doing uh, the jerk and, you know, a, a few years after, you know, so there was, there was, it, and, and a lot of guys were going from TV into features right around that same time. Um, but uh, I have to say the, the whole Annie Hall thing, you started to hear, like you say, that freshness and the naturalism of dialogue and characters that you kind of actually believed as opposed to you know, Rock Hudson and Doris Day from the previous decade. And I'm not saying those weren't funny. Those were skillful, well-crafted movies. But this was, unlike the movies of my childhood, the comedies of my childhood, you know, with the exception of something like, uh, some like It Hot or The Apartment, this was, this, you you really heard these people. I mean, you you said, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sound that's, in some way familiar to me, it, 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 it's, it's coming out of a real life place. So even like on a, on a much more sort of um, silly or high concept movie like, like Night Shift or Splash, our first two movies, there was still kind of, and then adding in the, the, the Neil Simon strain, you, you, you really kind of could, could uh, you, you really sort of felt like you had a place to go mm -hmm. that, was, that felt real and, 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 and natural and that you could write characters, we could write ourselves in a way. We, we, could, do, we, could, we, could, we could put ourselves in the movie because Woody did, you know. Now, we're not, but he, he put himself in the movie and we, you know. He puts that, himself in the movie when he's not even in the movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, but I mean, Henry Winkler's character, the, the Chuck character in Night Shift, that's my alternate reality. For myself, I'd never become a comedy writer. I take the civil service exam. I'm working nights in a city morgue. That's how I see myself. That's me, and I'm scared. I'm scared all the time. I have no life. I'm scared of the dog in the in the hallway. There was a dog in the hallway where I lived. I was scared of, you know. And and, and you know. And but but all those things, like Neil Simon, like Woody Allen, they, they were the kind of things that made you feel, yeah, you can write yourself. You're allowed. You're allowed to write yourself. Or, you know, and, and the guys you grew up with. So Neil Simon, Woody Allen, uh, IAL Diamond, and Billy yeah. Wilder. Yes. Um, what about uh, and 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 you loved and you loved Carl Reiner. Loved oh, Carl Reiner. Carl Reiner. The oh. Dick Van Dyke Show to this day. When we watched it a few years ago, we 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 spent we spent our lunch hour every day for a year watching episodes of the Dick Van Dyke Show. You just, as Baba Lou said, we'd watch like what one episode, and he, and he would say, he'd say, "It's a little movie." You'd see this this episode, you know, and and you'd just go, "That was a that was a twenty five minute movie. That was that was just, it was just perfect. They just they just got inside him, and 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 just just lovely." But here's the thing: when we worked in TV, and you would tell everybody, and I, 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 it just would come to me naturally. Take from your life. That a lot of the guys did not take from their life. That was, used to drive me crazy. A, the, uh, thank you for reminding there, me. That. There's a mirror, a, 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 a one step removed from reality. That that's what, then when I go, I feel them. You know, to, to sit, when we work with Sidney Pollack, we, we did one thing with him, and he if he ever instilled anything on us, it's it's. He said, I can, I can see the machinery. I can see, I can the, see the machinery. When, when, you when, know? when you have a director who's, who's, who's a tremendous, brilliant man rolling on the floor, literally, he wrote it, something. Ro yeah, and writhing in pain because we wrote something that he just didn't find authentic. You know, and, you just, and, and <laughs> I'm glad Babalu mentioned that thing about the writers. The writers used to joke at me, not with the, at me, about that I was always 
they, they knew my whole biography. They knew my whole autobiography just from sessions in the writer's room. And I'll go, yes, you know it because I'm trying to set an example. I'm trying to, are you, are you guys saving it for your movie? Is that why you're not going to? My wife, when we're in company, says, be careful what you say. It will appear in a movie. Yes. Because it's life. Well, and Gary life used to always say, so I'll never steal your writing, but I will steal your life. You know, and, and we, we always, and I was always trying to get the rest. Do you live? Where do you go? For, you, you had parents. You have a crazy cousin. You have so Where is that real? You know, I've stopped. Stop writing sitcoms that's based on other sitcoms. You know, try to try to get it. Well, it's the same from, thing with movies today. You know, it, it's it's a second generation of something that they saw, as opposed to all right, turn away from the screen, look out the window, mm -hmm. and and just you know, try to try to get yourself, try to get yourself into that in, into this show or into into this movie, uh, and so I was always there was always a method to the madness. I was always telling them anecdotes about my relations with my friends, with my parents, I think, to try to generate this kind of um, real uh, that's what sense makes, memory, you know. That's, that's what makes parenthood so real, because it is real. There is a, every moment in there happened to somebody who was involved. Well, in the, parenthood is probably our best uh, thought of movie, especially among other writers. I know the audience in general may prefer, you know, a couple of others, but, but I always felt that because every single thing in the movie had actually happened in its in its acorn form to one of the creators of the movie, either right. Bob Lou or me or Ron or Brian, even if those things hadn't actually happened to every member of the audience, because what, what are the odds, it had the stink of truth on it. Right. You know, and, and an audience, I think, instinctively and sensed it. They, they instinctively sensed that they weren't being, you know, just pulled around by the, they weren't being BS'd. Case, from, uh, from the credits, when it wasn't something we wrote, it was Ron conceived, you know, when he, when Steve was, they're at an, they're the at amount of time park. it takes to get your kids into when the car. When he's loading his kids into the car, the audience goes, I know this movie. It's, I've lived this, and they were on board. And it, where we've had movies that are just, oh man, it's a fight. It's a fight to get the audience to embrace it, and you, sometimes we never could. Yeah, I, w I would say to Babalu sometimes at a screening of a movie that the audience really liked, you know, one of our one of our films that that never had any trouble, Splash. you know, connecting. Yeah. Splash is a perfect example. I I would say to Babalu, I said, they're laughing eights and nines for jokes that are sixes and sevens, you know. I was like, they're they're, they're enjoying the joke more than it deserves to be enjoyed because they have simply chosen for whatever reason, quickly to want to like this movie. You're talking about the importance of believability yeah. in your writing. And one of your big hits was a movie about a mermaid, Splash. Yeah. So how do you reconcile those Well, two I, I reconcile it very easily. Let me just back up for five seconds. When Ron and Brian said about, about Night Shift, two guys uh, you know, working in a, in a morgue, running a call girl service, my immediate thought was, um, how could this have happened to me? And they said, it couldn't happen. We know you. It couldn't happen to you. And I said, that's what's funny, <laughs> okay? Rather than do sort of the, you know, two kind of crazy sway, you know, guys said, said, how could, and that, yes. how could I get finagled? How could, how could my life take, go through it, it, these weird twists and turns? You know, why is a man working the night shift? Yeah. Who is this guy? Yeah. What happened in this guy's life? There's you know, a guy hiding out, which he was. He was yeah. hiding out from life. How does how does your life that that's a sign that your life has gone wrong? That's nobody's dream to work the night shift. To in hang the city with more. the dead? To hang with the dead. You, know, you are uh, dead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and 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 I'm saying, how could it happen to me? How could I, six months from now, be arrested for being a pimp? Me, Lowell. How could that happen? You know, that was what was important to me uh, in, in figuring that out. You, you want to stay light on your feet in that sometimes you want the story and the characters to tell you where they want to go. But, you know, Babalu always has a great phrase. I'm going to steal from you right in front of your face. He says, there's a lot of ways to find treasure. I like a map. Uh, so so you 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 so we kind of know where we want it to end up. And then every once in a while you realize you're not headed in that right. direction. And then you have and that's that is the problem solving. But you have choices. You could go. 
or maybe I won't wind up there. Maybe it's okay to not wind up there. Maybe I'm going to a different place or more likely um, we got to we got to trace the breadcrumbs back to where we started to, to, to with with started to diverge from from the story we we're trying to tell and 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 figure out how you get back. But you know, while you diverge, you found a very inter- you found some very interesting scenery, and you don't want to eliminate right. that from from your trip either if I'm using the journey metaphor yeah. now you don't want to you don't want to you don't want to lose that well from... I'll use the circulatory sometimes you take that journey and the blood stops flowing mm-hmm. yes you, there's a clot somewhere yes and we're in there's a vein we've got a we, we've made we've and made... now we've had two days in a row where we haven't written good mm-hmm. okay uh and you got to go when well, was when was it last when when was it last good you know I mean we, we how did we we got to we we got is easy we got to a to a limb where the blood isn't flowing anymore. If we're stuck for two days, we're professionals. <laughs> we shouldn't be stuck for because two days. Because to me, it's a living entity. Yes. So you, 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 so it's all of that. Like I say, you want to get to a certain place, but there's a, there's a choice you made that you like for other reasons that you don't want to sacrifice. And, and there's a lot of problems. Well, what if, you know, we think, what if we shifted that? What if that, you know, I mean, in TV, it was sort of my strength was that I could sit in my office. I'd have a lot of episodes going on at the same time, and I was and I was young, and I, my short-term memory was fabulous. <laughs> and and a writer would come in and go, um, "Wait a minute, how come when when he comes in, how come he already didn't know? Because he was at the he was at the restaurant with his sister, so he would have already had that information." And I would know immediately what scene, what episode they were talking right. about, because I was smart then. And I would go, I would go, "Ah, yes, all right, well then." She's going to have to not know because she, you know, and, and you do a lot of that. It's a, it's a lot of that, you know, and, and, and because it, it does have to, whatever, the, a journey, uh, a, a circulatory system, you're building a house. Yeah. You know, it's all, all of these different metaphors. But, but uh, yeah, it's a, a lot of problem solving. So do tell us about the um, reconciling the... Um, oh, splash. Yeah. Well... Here's the thing about a fantasy element. You know, the best science fiction, or the best Twilight Zones, to me, were always ones where obviously something supernatural happened, but everybody behaved realistically except for the fact that something impossible had happened in their lives. But That's why we gave Tom Hanks a career that was so grounded. Well, we... He, would they distribute fruit? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, everybody key, knows that. The key is 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 for him to to deal with the fact, you know, which which was first to keep it a secret from him for a long time, which was which was that was kind of that was kind of our first big idea when we started working on it was was to was to was to have an extended period of the script where sh- we knew she was a mermaid but he did not and that's a long long part of the movie and that is specifically so that he can be as real and as true as possible and when he found out sort of two-thirds of the way or maybe it's even more when he finds out that that she is a mermaid it can hit him with enormous impact and you can identify and go I've I've already fallen in love with that girl. I think of her as my girlfriend, as my perhaps even my fiance. I'm in love. I have now found out this impossible thing, so I I, I can it it's it, it, he he's he's completely established as a person who in, in is having a real world romance in a real life, and and that was that that was that was sort of the crucial no, and here's where opening we up. For here's it. where we weren't fools. Because she doesn't come into what, into the movie. What page? Yeah, she's not in a movie till like twenty five. So we pages created in. we created this opening where they meet as as children. A fan, yeah, a fantasy, of, yeah, yeah, fairy tale, fairy tale. Where when the audience saw this tiny little mermaid, they went ooh, and they just this yeah. resistance was all yeah, we, we, and that was just because we go, folks, there, there's a mermaid. Yeah, she we used them. we used actually a similar trick in City Slickers. Uh, we always use similar tricks. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody does. We used a similar trick at City Stickers. We knew we were going to be a long time till we got them on our cattle drive because right. we wanted it to be. We wanted him to be so real. That's why, if anybody remembers City Stickers, it's why 
you, you, you see him at work, you see him go to his kid's career day, make down. a fool of himself his right. career day, have a birthday party, have his best friend exposed as being, as, as, as having, a, having an affair with a, with a young girl in the supermarket that he manages for his wife's father. All of this kind of, all, all of this life going on. But we said the downside is, you know, th th he's not going to, they're not going to act, you're not going to actually see horses or cattle right. for, for like 20, 30. So th we, we opened in that where they run from the bulls in Pamplona in the first three minutes of the movie. So you just go, okay, you see, we're, we're, we're funny, we're exciting. We're, it's an adventure. <laughs> it's an adventure. It, hang on, hang on, you're in good hands. You know, it's somebody, more than one person, a lot of people said, boy, you know, in comedy, especially in a movie, said, you, you gotta convince the, early, the audience early on that they're in good hands, that they're right. safe, that, that, they're, that their comedy, uh, their, their, their sense of humor is not going to be abused. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, so we, we take that, we take that very, very strongly to heart. When I read one of my son's things, I'll say, that's a perfectly good joke you have on page one, but not for page one. I go, I, I even if you're just giving it to somebody to read, like a producer or something, uh, first joke out of the box can't be, can't be uh, middleweight. You know, if you, if you put that same joke on page 11, that's a perfectly good <laughs> joke. Congratulations. But I, I, you, and especially if you've got like two of them. You got two middleweight jokes. To, to, you know, to, to, you're setting a tone. You're setting a tone. You have to get the audience on your side. You're setting yeah. it, and that's yeah, you know. yeah. But I think you know, Splash was it was it was absolutely say you have this you have this absurd element. She's a she's a mermaid, and then don't put make anything else ridiculous or hard to believe around it. A League of Their Own was. Uh, Based on the board game, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Penny Marshall. Gary Marshall's sister. Gary Marshall's sister, with whom I had a long history, having been one of the co-creators of <laughs> Vernon Shirley, um, sent, sent us a, a, a little, like a 15-minute thing that had shown on PBS right. about a reunion I'm the world's biggest baseball fan, okay, mm -hmm. in, like in the world. And, and she just said this to me. It said, do you, do you know about that? Have you heard of this? And I said, no. This is actually, I got it, I'm, I'm empty on this one. That there was a girls, they, I'm not being uh, chauvinist, they called it the girls baseball mm -hmm. league, not women, all ladies. And, and um, uh, in the 40s, I said, no, I had no idea. And they were showing these women, this was like, uh, you know, 40, 50 years after the fact, so, uh, you know, kind of elderly at this point, and this reunion they had, and this guy did kind of these kind of so-so interviews with them and everything. And, and we, you saw him singing on the bus, these elderly women. Singing like their camp song on the bus, and I just thought right away, and then they were having a reunion at Cooperstown. You couldn't go for some reason. I don't remember why. I, must I, have been having children. Yeah, at probably. Some point. <laughs> yeah, he's usually having children. I'm having children. Oh, yeah, and sporadically. I, but, and I uh, went up to Cooperstown, and it was it, to, to interview them, uh, which I hate. I hate doing research, and 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 they were really unreflective about their lives, as a lot of people are. You mm. find that's why some people are writers and some aren't. You know, and. And I started to talk to them, and it seemed, sounded very familiar to me, even though they didn't see it that way. As I, I may have said earlier, I said, to me, it sounded like me going out from New York to California to try to become a comedy writer. Is them coming from all of these kind of almost exclusively rural places. And they were kind of outcasts because they were girls who played baseball, you know, in, in, in 1942. And... and and, and it just it just struck us kind of as a fun story, you know. And and uh, and Penny wanted to do it, you right. know. And and she was she was coming off a big and awakening. So oh, it's like I mean, to be honest, I mean, I, I we always like to we like to work with people who who uh, who have um, who speak the same language. Yeah, but who also have carved out some space for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. We don't like being the uh, the driving force on a project. It doesn't really suit us mm -hmm. temperamentally. Uh, we like to be uh, under the wing 
of somebody who has a lot of uh, cachet. <laughs> It's, um, we, we like the. We'll the, follow the elephants. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Even if there's shit on the floor, we'll follow them. We, we, we really are not trying to be stars no. in, in, in any way. We, we, we're very, very grateful to the, you know, to the, the Ron Howards and the Penny Marshalls and the Billy Crystals and, you know, and, and if, if it's, if it's the, the Farrelly brothers or, or Ivan Wright or, or any, uh, 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 Harold Ramis, who were, you know, with, or the, or the stars who, you know, who, who, who kind of muscle a project through with Steve or, or somebody. We, you know, that, that's, that's what we like. We, we actually don't want to be uh, the, you know, the sort of the uh, responsible for kind of uh, convincing people to, to go ahead with something. You know, it's so, uh, you know, Penny was kind of, had, had, a lot of, had a lot of strength at the studio. So, you know, and... and uh, uh, so we were excited about about uh, right. about doing it with her. And what about Tom Hanks? When did he get into it? That's an interesting story. I hope <laughs> he. We wrote that character to be much older. We were actually like thinking somebody like Paul Newman, yeah, who at the time I guess would have been in his mid to late sixties. That's what we were thinking it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're thinking kind of in that area, and then. Uh, Penny said, Tom would like to do it. And Tom at the time, I think, was still in his 30s. And so, first of all, we had to, we had to rewrite it to sort of explain right. why he's been washed up so long. His 30s. So we gave him the limp, you know. Right. And we, we said that we had a funny story. I don't even know if it stayed in the movie that he, you know. Jumped out the window. He jumped out the window because he was caught with somebody's wife in a, in a hotel room when he was a, when he was a player. Um, but we said, you know, great, fantastic. And at the time, I hope Tom wouldn't mind us telling this story. I don't mm -hmm. even know if he knows this is true. He wouldn't mind, would he? He knows his filmography. Yeah. So it hadn't been like, it wasn't like his best two years leading up to that, you know, which is a great lesson. You're, I mean, this is before Forrest Gump in Philadelphia. I'd like to hide in a movie. Yeah, he said, I'd like to be in a movie that I'm not... Carrying? Carrying. And... Sony was not excited. Penny had to talk them into it. I believe they actually wanted Michael Douglas. That's right. That's correct. Because they said he he has international uh, strength and Tom doesn't. Um, you know, and uh, Penny, you know, Penny fought for him, and uh, and and uh, you know, it was, it was just. But I mean, I, I, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we thought it was a fantastic idea. Instant, we immediately went back to the office and wrote it for a younger man. Just from hearing that Tom wanted to be in it, we were thrilled. One of our great laments is we wrote we wrote a sequel that was not about the girls. It was about him. We at, at his behest we wrote we wrote a movie his, called his, Jimmy Dugan. His relationship with a black ball player. Yeah, it was around the time that. It was, it was like it, right after. It, it was a wraparound. It was like it took place before league and after. And then league. after about, about him being sort of managing the big leagues at the time that, uh, that the major leagues was integrated. And this friendship he, he developed with sort of a Jackie Robinson type of, of player, which, which we never got made. And, and uh, it should have, would have been great. Tom did a reading of it, you know, did a cast reading of it. And he was great. As you would as you would guess, but uh, Sony they weren't that enthusiastic. They didn't, they didn't they didn't particularly want to do it. Still could happen. Well, not with Tom. Yeah, but it's I don't think I don't yeah. think Tom's going to play a ball player anymore. <laughs> I mean, he's very youthful. He keeps himself in good shape, but he's he's, he's not not of that age. The uh, the the signature scene, I guess, I would say maybe you wouldn't of that movie was the uh, no crying in baseball. I mean, it just was so memorable. Became a, became a, a catchphrase. Yeah. So, for the from a writing standpoint, what were you doing in that scene? You know, it's a beautiful thing, and I'm glad you mentioned it because it really, I think, speaks to everything we've spoken about. We recently found the handwritten page of that because uh, we were donating some papers and things, and and um, we we uh, we. You, you can see on the page where we're like crossing out in the middle of that sentence, you know, where we're getting the wording kind of right, because it's just flowing out of the scene. It's not like somebody 
coming into the office one day and saying, I've got it. You know what would be a great no. catchphrase in this movie? He berates a young, young woman. She begins to cry, and then if, it, you, if, you, if you can get into that character, yeah. it's what it, it was. The point was to show his, his astonishment of what he was dealing with, how, how out of water that fish was. That, that, he, that after all of his years in baseball, as he put it, you know, being, being, a, being verbally abused by Rogers Hornsby, being, you know, whatever. He, he called me a talking pile of pig shit, and my parents were. That's my parents were at the game, you yeah. know. That was the, you know. Was, was, was the, it was just to play the, the amazement in Jimmy and Tom that, that he, he, was, he was dealing with, a, with an ilk, <laughs> a group of humans that could be, that could be re reduced to tears because he was, he was yelling at them. And then the, this, you know, and it was just that you can't cry. It's not allowed. You know, it's, it's just, it's not part of the, it's not part of the contract. It's not, it's not part of what we do. And then it, it just, you, you can, you can actually see, cause I, we, I hand write, you know, as, as we're talking to each other, you can actually sort of see it come into, into shape just to which words are crossed out and see to which, which is, so my point is just that it, it's, it's only good to us if it's, forgive the phrase, organic, you know, it's just, if it's really kind of, uh, if, if it, if it grew, out of out of an intention, a valid intention, not you know, and and that's the true of of, of the jokes, but, also. But but performance elevated the writing. Yes, oh, yes. I I, yes. I, I I could still see watch. They used to send us dailies in those days, and you and you watch Tom, we were roaring. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had the same experience on Parenthood. We we, Ron did this great thing. He he rehearsed Parenthood for three weeks like a play. And we were at the rehearsals. And we'd go back to the, to the rented room. And yeah, then we'd have a meeting. We'd, we'd do rewrites like we, were in, like we were in Philadelphia or New Haven with a show. We, we'd, we'd rewrite. But you had that experience where, where you'd see like anybody in there, Jason Robards, Diane Weiss, Mary Steenberg, you know, all those people that, right? And I, you know, we, we'd, turn, we'd turn to each other and, and, and we'd go, I said, are we that good? Or, you know, they, oh, it's just, they, they just elevate, you know, you just go, they found, you know, you go, they, they found stuff that we didn't know was there, stuff that isn't actually there. The simplest thing, I mean, it's so simple, it, it probably, uh, maybe it could be left unsaid, but, uh, you know, when I, when I talk to students, it, it, it's, the character can't say what you want them to say. A lot of the, you know, the spec scripts we read, you go, this, this dialogue is only being said because the writer wants to take it to a place. This or, character, or, or is, he, the, he feels the audience needs to have this information. Why does that character want to say what he's saying? What is what is motivating him or her to say these words? I don't believe it. I don't believe they're talking about her parents in this way when they're a couple that have been going out for a year. I don't believe it. You better be able to answer the actor when they say, why, why am I saying this? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, an, that's an obsession with us. I mean, it, it, it really is. Where, where, you know, as much as Sidney Pollack was writhing on the floor, you could see how far to the right he was because it's our obsession and he would occasionally find us inauthentic yes. where you'd go, well, there, there are, you'd say, Sidney, there are such things in the world as coincidences. People do you know, go back to, to get their hat and overhear something. You know, the Greeks did that. You know, it's like, it's, it, it is allowed. You go, no, no, you know, and, and you go, okay, but it was good because he, you know, he, he made he us. Called, he referred to himself as a logic Nazi. Yeah. So, you know, he kept us, he, he you know, he, he, he kept us on the line, toes on the line. But, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's not funny. To, uh, it's not only, not really, it's not funny us if, if you don't feel like it like it actually happened like it like it, it's it's just it, it's just uh, it, it, it's an expression of whatever is 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 actually going on uh, that, that you I, we don't like to be we don't like to be caught reaching for for a joke um, now we do reach for them but we we, we throw leaves and twigs over, over. You go, one of us will say a joke in the middle of a thing, and you go, oh, that is funny. Now, 
how do we get there, but not, you know, so that, so that by, the, by the time you arrive at that joke, you feel that character could not have said anything else. Right. That, 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 is the most, that, that is the most likely thing for that person to have said. Writers work in different ways. They work head to head, they trade scenes, um, they write on typewriters, they write on computers, they write longhand. How do you, how do you two work? Uh, Team, the, teams do these. I was a joke. I hold the pen, you move the paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to move the desk, but my back isn't the same. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. 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 Yes. We're going back for some of the old ones here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we, we write head to head. It's very noisy. It's very improvisational. In fact, in fact, we were recently. We had to soundproof our office because the people in the yeah, we're sitting, office. When we're not working, we're quiet. We're sitting. We're reading the paper. But then when we get into, like, currently we're trying to get this. We're other putting movie. a pitch together so, for, a, for a movie. It's like every people go to the office manager. We, you know, we we're the, we're the, you know, we're the young couple next door making love. Yeah. You're hearing all the moaning and the groaning. And yes. you go, oh, yeah. well. No, we're, 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 we're absurdly loud. I more than So he, they literally, and, yeah. Yeah, they, they have to put us in a soundproof. In a, in a soundproof booth. Um, because as he said, let quiet, quiet, quiet meetings meet quiet scripts. Yeah, we, and you we, go. it's very, it's improvisational in a sense, even though there's an outline, but in, in terms of dialogue, we're, we're as I said, we, we are obsessed with dialogue sounding natural, so we're, we're talking, you know, we're, we're, we're in conversation with each other. Um, I'm around so long in this business that when I started out, long handwriting was actually more convenient than with typing. A, with a quill. <laughs> hey, Bic. Yeah. The, the typing was actually absurdly inconvenient before word process. You literally cut and paste, you know, and guys, you'd be right, somebody would be taking that go, all right, wait a minute. You know, and, and the typewriter, was, this was so... When word process came in, I'd already been writing in longhand for so many years that we just didn't bother to, to, to make the change over. Uh, we didn't think we were going to last that much longer anyway, but you we sit, did. You sit at two desks opposite each other? One desk, one, one desk. big desk. One big wide desk. Right. One big wide right. desk opposite each other. Nobody on a couch? No. 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 Occasionally, if we're in the uh, a really early stage, I may lie down Unlike for, uh, Billy for Wilder, we minutes. don't go out to lunch and buy paintings. We, we, yeah. we, we don't take a nap in we the afternoon. We don't take a nap. We, we come in. We read the paper. Yeah, no. Yeah. But um, you do read the paper. Isn't that interesting? We do. Uh, well, I, you know what? I no longer... Re he reads the paper. I, I'm on the phone and I'm on my laptop. Reading. Yeah. We, 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 you know, it, it, it's... There are people who think we work harder than other writers, and there are people who think we work the laziest of... of the, we're the laziest writers. And, and the, the reason is because we work like... 48 weeks a year. So those people think we're, we're, the, we're the hardest working writers, but we only work like several hours a day. Mm -hmm. So people sometimes think we're the laziest writers. We, we always try to keep it uh, as job-like as possible. So you get in at what time? Uh, I get in usually around 1030. I get uh, in a little nice later. Nice job. Yeah. I get in a little later. Yeah. I stop off and say hello to the grandson who lives down the street. Yeah. I play a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then we get, we're home in time for dinner and we do this every day. Right. You know, we don't take like months off and uh, th things like that. This question is, um, what are you proudest of? And I assume this means which work that you've done are you proudest of and why? Wow. Wow. Well, to be, you know, to talk about specific, Parenthood was the truest movie. Um, and, and that was a movie that when it was being pitched around, uh, people said, um, this is going to be like a, a, you, it's like a kind of a glorified TV show. You're just doing, you know, 30 something, which mm -hmm. was kind of a hit show in, mm -hmm. in the day. It's not even a movie really. Um, in fact, I think we had to do that like at a cut price. We had to write it at a. Which parenthood? Yeah. 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 Because it was it like seemed so kind of. Uh, what, what have you got here? You got. You we wrote. Know, we wrote a home movie. That's what we felt we were writing. Yeah. Um, so I felt good about about that. Uh, I've always felt. 
uh, you know, I've always felt kind of particular, particularly good, especially since like over the years, other writers, younger writers, have kind of, have kind of seemed to have a warm spot for it as a, as a, uh, just as, as a script, as a, you know, how it was, how it was structured and everything. I, I think what I'm proudest of is we, we there was sort of, it was a movie in which there were kind of four distinct storylines, sort of different characters. They were linked because they were all in one general uh, extended family, and we, we we put the thing together, and 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 we talk about it with Ron. He said, "Well, you know, it's it's modular enough so that if you don't have the scenes in exactly the right order, you know, that it creates exactly the right flow, it'll be a lot of fun in editing. You know, mm -hmm. we'll be able to, you know, kind of mix and match and and move things." around and and the movie was released in exactly the order we had it on our bulletin board and i i think i don't know for whatever reason maybe it's false but i've always always felt really good about that that you know that we kind of we really saw the whole thing it, it uh, how you know how it would work because you bounced from from story to story and and we kind of i felt like we kind of got it we wanted to demonstrate that you could be just as funny being true as somebody else could be being absurd, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of absurd movies mm -hmm. I really enjoy throughout mm -hmm. history. There have mm -hmm. been, you know, absurdist uh, comedy that, that are a lot of, you know, that are, that are great. Um, it's not particularly our our strength, um, but you know, sort of what what I loved best about Parrot was was that it, it didn't it 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 didn't get less it didn't get any less funny than it needed to be or than we wanted it to be because we were diligent. About about it being, you know, as, as true as we could as we could write it. So you know, that's uh, um, um, I kind of felt that way about another movie we did that was much less successful, which was Mr. Saturday Night with Billy Crystal, which which I felt was um, uh, really right. I mean that that it was just that that the it, it, it's, I just felt it was true. You know, I mean I just it, that if if you if you accepted that that character lived in the world, which we did, because we kind of knew those people, that that, that 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 was the real, that anybody who knew that world would know that that was real. And it was no less funny than anything else we could have written for being, for being that true. Now, that one, the audience didn't embrace in, in the same way. But, you know, there's a certain point beyond which yeah, it is kind of our job to be well liked and 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 popular and 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 make up. You know, it's, it's it's a business. People are spending a lot of money to, to make these movies, but there is a point beyond which you can't. Uh, uh, you 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 do sort of have to give up control. A lot of the low points for me are the movies that didn't get made. The scripts we wrote that I love. We worked that, seven that years, are stillborn. Seven years on a screenplay. I'll call it Into the Woods. Would have been a, a based on the Sondheim Lapine. Ne and never did we want to leave because we just we loved. The I mean, material. long past we weren't being paid anymore. We just kept writing on. That's it. a long time. And like I out. mentioned, Jimmy Dugan before, and and uh, there are a few. There, there's a, there are a couple now that still might get made, you know. But uh, um, uh, those those to me are the most painful because we don't we don't write as an ex. Even if we got paid, even if we got paid for them. Which is great. My dad, when he was a living, used to say that, you know, he goes, did you get paid? Yeah. <laughs> I go, yeah. Yes, dad, we got paid. All right, well, then you're lucky. And I go, yes, you're right. We are lucky. Somebody paid us to write ha-ha. That is absolutely, in and of itself, an incredibly good fortune. But um, those, are, those are tough. Now, as far as the movies that come out that are, you know, we had a movie out a few years ago that we loved. And we loved working with everybody. We did a movie with the Farrelly brothers called, called Fever, Fever Pitch, Pitch with Drew Barrymore and and uh, Jimmy Fallon. And, and Jimmy Fallon, and it was it, it was well reviewed, you know. And uh, uh, the Farrelly brothers were fantastic. We loved. They were so. It was the first time they directed a script that they hadn't written, and they were so loyal to the script. And and Drew was was the goddess protecting the script. Incredibly loyal. If she you know, left the room and we made a cut, she'd come back. Where's that? You know, and 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 they did a they, they did a beautiful job, and people liked the movie, but they didn't particularly go to see it in mm -hmm. in in great numbers, and I, I felt bad about it, you know, because and I, not just for I felt bad for for them. They they, you know, they they believed in our script. We had written it. They loved it. They decided to to make it, you know, and and were, like I say, devoted to the to the to the to, the, to every word in it, mm -hmm. and uh, 
you know, then they, they couldn't convince people to, you know, to come see it. And, and you sort of went, gee, that, I, I really liked that movie. You know, I wish, I wish everybody had, had I, you know, I wish they, they, they'd got, you know, the worst thing I always say is um, uh, when you have a movie and uh, it, it doesn't do particularly well, and like a year later, you run into somebody you know, and they go, uh, hey, I saw Fever Pitch. Uh, we rented it or something. You know, I saw it on TV. You go, I go, yeah. And, uh, and they go, it was good. You know, that tone of voice, yeah. it was good means I had no I, inkling that it was going to be good. The, the, the zeitgeist, the, 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 the buzz in the air yeah. was that I didn't need to see it, that it wasn't a movie I had to go see. And now I see it a year later and it turns out I, I liked it. And you go, well, that's nice as far as it goes, but uh, that's kind of, uh, and now we just had a couple of movies that were just kind of bad. Uh, you know, no, so we did a movie right before Parenthood. Oof. Right at the height of, of our, of, we did a movie called uh, Vibes. In fact, the Guild took back their card yeah. <laughs> after that one. With Cindy Lauper and Jeff Goldblum and Peter Falk. And it just, it just somehow devolved into a mess. I mean, meetings at poolside at a hotel with Cindy Lauper was explaining to us what's funny and what isn't. True story. You know, and true and, story. And you leave that, and you go, "We're in, we got trouble." And, and, and you know, it just how do we how do we climb out of you know? And 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 we never quit. We just never quit. We never walk off a project. You know, we just we just keep rewriting and rewriting to to try to you know, to just, to try to repair anything, you know, and, and uh, it was brutal. It was brutal. And, and, and I, re I remember we, it, it, it opened to no business and our agent, Rosalie Swedlin, our agent, Rosalie Swedlin at the time called us and said, <laughs> Yeah. I think it's time for you guys to get a bump. Rosalie? Which means a raise. Rosalie, what, uh, what, so were Rosalie, you vacationing on a different planet yeah. this weekend? Do you remember which clients you're calling? He says, why? What are you talking about? What happened? I said, did you see the trades? Did you see? Because in those days, you had to wait till Monday to see how bad your movie yeah. did. And I said, um, Vibes of it. Says, says, what has that got to do with you? You did your job. So I said, we wrote it. I said, you did your job. You wrote a script that got made, that they were able to get a director, cast it, and make it. The last thing that happened with, with you that, that matters is that Ron Howard and Steve Martin agreed to do Parenthood, which hadn't been made yet. That's the last important news in, in your career, but we couldn't help it anyway. We just, we hated, because we had to look at it and agree that at least half, the, it, wasn't, it wasn't just somebody else's opinion, which is what we felt like on Mr. Saturday Night or on Fever Pitch or on, or on uh, 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 you know, Ed TV right. or other movies that didn't do as well in the marketplace as we wanted it to do. This one we had to look at and go, yeah, that isn't funny, or at least half the movie. That's actually not funny. You know, and I think it was the first time we'd ever had our names on something where, where we, f it wasn't just we said, well, they can't all be hits, which is an attitude you can take. This is one where you said, yeah, this isn't really good. I tell you what my, one of my strengths is. It's not only writing internally, but it's externally. I always know where the audience is. I'm always aware there's a part of me that's sitting in the theater watching. Mm -hmm. Thinking it, about and, and it's something somebody should, the, the third eye is really important. It's really a question of at what point in the process do you want to bring that third eye in yeah. before, you're even, before you're even conceiving of an idea or, you know, I mean, but it, it, it is kind of a, uh, you know, you are, you are writing to be seen. Bad things happen. You get a call from Rosalie or whoever, whoever your agent is now, and they say, and she says, uh, they passed. And because you've been waiting and you've been hoping they weren't going to pass. Pass, pass, you're, or you're, you're off the project. You're off the project. Yeah. It's, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. You've yeah. just started your day. Yeah. You're sitting there at your yeah. desk. You've just gotten this news, this thing you were hoping for for the past couple of months isn't going to happen, or yeah. that what you've been doing, you aren't going to be doing anymore. What do you do? What do, you do? Um, Emotionally and what do you do in terms well, of? How do you Let, deal with it? Let's be real. Let's be honest. I won't mention names, but in a two-week span, was it last year? I mean, how many times were we kicked? Like three times one month on, you know, pictures that, that never got going afterwards. Mm -hmm. they, they just, you know, I mean, it, it's just, um, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, ideally what we, what we used to do, uh, 
is we were, we were it's still true to a certain extent, you're always already writing the next thing. There's something, or, or somebody is waiting for you for the, for the, for the next thing. Um, it, it, it's, you, you, just, you just go on, it, that, that's over, that, that's, you know, bury your dead. You know, um, no postmortems, no crying to but, each other. But, uh, as idiots. my mother said, yeah, bury your dead, but don't forget. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yes. Yeah, so my mom has passed away a couple of years ago. She still remembers those who did her bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it, it's no, it, it, it's it's difficult. You know, you try to get you try to you try to get a perspective. You you just you know it, it's it's. Uh, you know, so, you know, I say it ain't cancer. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's. Uh, it, it, it's it's something you can, it, you know, we, we're doing this a really long time. We've had every imaginable experience. I mean, that, that's all I could say. There's, it, it's it's tough at this point for something to happen that uh, that uh, uh, you know we that hasn't already happened to us once before that we've that we've already been able to process. But um, uh, you know, I mean, it, it kind of we did a thing. So we did a thing where where. Uh, Something like this happened, and we we looked, we went back and looked at the material, and said, um, "Do we have anything to worry about, really? You know, are we? Are you kidding? You know, and you just you just read it. You said, no, this is fine, this is good, this is this, this is good work. This is this this has to do with all the various permutations of craziness that go on in the movie business, and why things, you know, it's it's like." I'll, 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 we'll pitch something. We'll pitch a movie that we want to do that we can't get done. My wife said, how'd it go? I said, the pitch went great. We had them s s laughing in a room stage. I said, said I, I believe though that it's not the movie that they actually want. It's, mm -hmm. it's not what they were hoping we would come in and pitch. They, they, they will agree that it's, it's good, but it wasn't what they wanted. And that's, you know, you, you, you just you just go, well, that's OK. You know, that that's, uh, you know, uh, but you, you don't you can't chase it. I mean, to me, I, I think you can't chase it. You can't okay. uh, like, go, what do they want this year? What you know, they want flying children. They want elves. What do they what do they want? I'll give them, you know, I'll, I'll, it's, I, I, you know, uh, it's all there's so much luck involved anyway. And I, I say that I have some credibility because we We've had some success, so I'm, 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 so it's not sour grapes. There's, there's so much, there's so much luck involved that your talent and ideas are where somebody else wants to be at the same time. You're just doing this all the time, and these, there's these points, these nodes, you know, where, where, what, what, what you want to do and what somebody wants you to do comes together at the same time, and then the third element that you're both right about. What, what the audience also wanted to see at the same time, and you did it good. And you also applied uh, 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 a respectable amount of craft to it. You know, that's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts there. So you, you just got to gotta go. That, that's, that's life, uh, you know, what did, uh, that's, that, that's life in the, what did William Goldman call it? Um, Adventures in the screen oh, trade. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, thank you. That's uh, you know, th and that's 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 just what it is. So you better just uh, you better just uh, you know be able to uh, handle the adventure. Thank you very much, Lowell and Bobbley. You're very welcome.